I am delighted to have the honor of introducing Dr. Catherine Magruder, a distinguished alumna of the School of Public Health and this year's recipient of the Tyroller Award. The Tyroller Award, as you heard from Andy, is given to an epidemiology graduate whose outstanding contributions to public health and epidemiology exemplify the impact that our program graduates can have on the larger society, not just in their small area. I'll keep my remarks brief so we can hear Dr. Magruder, but I would be remiss if I didn't actually mention a few of her accomplishments. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology at Duke University, which is that other blue school, and <laughs> her master's and PhD in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill. Her career has been quite broad-based, um, beginning at the Veterans Administration, followed by RTI and NIH. At NIH, she became branch chief, a branch chief at the National Institute of Mental Health. She's currently a full professor at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Department of Psychiatry and Public Health. Public Health Sciences, excuse me. She's also the director of the university's Office for Research Integrity. Dr. Magruder has held leadership positions as the chair and governing counselor for the APHA Alcohol, Tobacco, and Other Drugs section, been associate editor for the Journal of Traumatic Stress. She's served on the board of directors of the International Society for Trauma and Stress Studies as well as actually serving on the board of directors of the SPH Alumni Association. She has published extensively, including well over 125 peer-reviewed journal articles, work on three books, co-authoring nine book chapters. She's received professional awards, professional development awards from the VA, and recently received a Fulbright Award to study trauma and PTSD in Turkish civilians. In scanning Dr. Magruder's CV, what struck me most was the breadth of her impact. Her work could be fairly described as psychiatric epidemiology with an emphasis on PTSD, and that, as such, has broad applicability and implications. PT PTSD, of course, is not limited to military veterans. It can afflict survivors of any traumatic event, from sexual assault to natural disasters. And the field of mental health, of course, touches all of our subject areas and all of our lives, in fact. Dr. Magruder's impressive body of work, which includes work on issues specifically related to women, um, has led to a far, far better understanding of the long-term consequences of stress and tra trauma and contributed to increased adoption of psychiatric screening in primary care. As one of our faculty colleagues put it so well, Psychiatric epidemiology is an area which is assuming increased importance with the rise of post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, and suicide as major public health issues for both women and men, particularly in age brackets that are usually among the healthiest of the life cycle. On a more personal note, Dr. Magruder has also raised two children and has four grandchildren, which is an accomplishment that those of us who are both parents and professionals can very well appreciate. Um, in addition, she is an active member of the Isle of Palms Island Turtle Team, which protects tur sea turtles, works to protect sea turtles. So with that, um, and without further ado, I would like to present the Tyroller Award to Dr. McGruder. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so very much for that really gracious and lovely introduction. Um, it's it's truly an honor to receive this award, um, and it's a special honor because I was really, I was lucky enough to have Dr. Tyroller teach me my very first course in epidemiology. Um, and he was an amazing teacher, as I'm sure anyone in the, in the room that had him knows. I will say he's probably rolling over in his grave right now. 
um, as I was not one of his better students. Um, I think he was not terribly thrilled about those of us in the psychosocial track. Um, but nevertheless, I think he did appreciate that, that, um, that um, there were big contributions to be made in psychosocial epidemiology. And um, so I thank him and I thank members of his family, too, um, for being here for this award and for the great start that he gave me. So I'd like to ask you all to join me um, on a roughly chronological journey um, covering the last 40 years. Um, and allow me to share some kind of fun memories for me and weave together some seemingly disparate themes. So anyone who has lived in the state of North Carolina um, has got to be aware that basketball is an important, a really major, an important thing here. Um, so back in 1973, in the 1973 to 75 period, when we'll start this journey, um, just a few little reminders. Dean Smith was the UNC coach. Um, he had started in 1961, and he was a legend, even, even in 1973. Mike Krzyzewski was still an active duty Army um, person, um, although he did start, I think, in about 74, 75 as an assistant coach at Indiana um, under Bobby Knight. Michael Jordan was 10 years old <laughs> and probably not any taller than you, Briggy, sitting there. Um, and in 1974, just a nod to the other team in the area, um, North Carolina State was the national champs in 1974. So that kind of gets us grounded here. Um, in terms of social happenings and events, um, the Beatles had broken up in 1970, but they were all, we were all still enjoying their music um, a lot. There was a gas crisis. I can remember I had to ride a bicycle into the School of Public Health every day from about four or five miles out because otherwise I would have had to stay in line at a gas station and the gas stations weren't even always open. Um, so it was really difficult to get gas at that time. I was in great shape, by the way, riding that bicycle back and forth. We didn't have personal computers. There were electric typewriters, um, but, uh, but no personal computers available. Smoking was widely accepted. You know, we forget about that. That's been kind of a public health victory. But many of my classmates smoked. Some of my professors smoked. And when we went to a party, when I had a party, it was considered the correct thing to do to have one room that only the smokers were in. Um, we would never ask anybody to leave or go outside. You could not buy a mixed drink in the state of, South, of North Carolina. Um, however, if you were 18 years old, you could drink beer or wine. So let's look a little more at the alcohol issue in North Carolina. Um, alcohol, um, back in that time, there was variability um, in terms of the availability of alcohol. Some of the counties were totally dry. For example, Chatham County, the county where I was born. By the way, I think we have a few representatives here from Chatham County. Um, would anybody who was born in Chatham County please stand? Those, there are several. <laughs> stand up. This is probably more people um, from Chatham County. That This is probably a record for this auditorium for the number of people of Chatham County. Um, but Chatham County was a, an example of a totally dry county. I can remember my aunt, when I would go to visit, would ask, please stop at the liquor store just on the other side in Orange County and bring me a bottle of such and such. Um, there were other counties that had um, only beer or only wine or some combination of beer and wine. Um, and then there were counties such as Orange County, Durham County, um, Wake County, that had all three varieties of beverages available. So I thought for a master's thesis, wouldn't that be interesting to look at mortality? How did mortality relate to availability? So I collected all of the mortality and divided it into alcohol-related and not. Um, and um, oh, and I fell in love, by the way, with age standardized and age standardization. I've standardized all those rates, um, age and race standardized too. And I looked at mortality as a function of the availability of alcohol in the counties. And sure enough in the counties that were totally wet. They had twice the mortality rate 
as the dry counties, even when you controlled for urbanicity. Um, so it was kind of a nice little little thesis. Um, the Europeans really loved it because they were trying to show a connection between policies and health outcomes. So it was published in a little Danish journal. Um, they translated it and published it. Um, and it also got published in a, um, one of the American journals. So in terms of mental health in 1973 to 75, um, we were using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 2. And for those of you who are not mental health people, um, the DSM is the equivalent to the International Classification of Diseases, or the ICD, only DSM is for psychiatric disorders. So DSM 2 was largely based on psychoanalytic theory. Um, there was so there was, it was a lot had of the diagnoses had to do with the etiology of disorder. Neurosis was there were lots of neuroses in the DSM-2. The most notable thing about DSM-2 was that in 1973 they revised it and removed homosexuality as a, a disorder. Treatment psychiatric treatment at that time medications were largely neuroleptics um, for psychotic disorders and uh, neuroleptics have terrible side effects tardive dyskinesia you know ir irreversible kinds of things for depression there were tricyclics and MAO inhibitors you know somewhat difficult to dose um, and of course tranquilizers. Oh, did I mention this thing about the war? Not yet. Um, there was this war in Vietnam. Um, let me stop here and just say how many people were um, not even born by 1975? Oh my. <laughs> um, I can see we'll need a little history lesson here. Um, the war in Vietnam, and it, it, this was kind of a bad war. I think generally almost everyone considered it a bad war. Um, you can see here the picture of the fall of our embassy in Vietnam. Number one, we lost the war, um, so that was not a very good war for us. And uh, number two, it was very controversial. Um, there was a lot of protests that were going on in the United States about that, amongst those who, who didn't go. Um, it was a war where young men were drafted. I mean, we, we forget that we had a draft back then, but um, they didn't want to necessarily be in that war. Um, there were a number of women who were in that war as well. Um, for, the, for the most part, about 75% of those women who served um, were nurses, um, and they went to Vietnam and served as nurses there. Um, they had to deal with a lot of, um, because they were nurses, they were generally a little older than the men who served because they had to go to three years of nursing school. Um, they were a little more educated, um, and they had to deal with a lot of casualties and issues that they probably were not terribly well prepared for, um, as, as I'll show in a few later slides. Um, I mentioned that it was a controversial war. Um, and this, you might think, is a picture of, of a battlefield in Vietnam, um, but not so. These are um, National Guard in Ohio, um, and this is at Kent State University. Um, lots of aspects about this war felt that in addition to the war in Vietnam, there was kind of a war at home, and it was between um, people who thought the war was a good thing and, and were in authority versus those who, who thought it was not a good thing. Um, and this is a picture of one, one of the four young people who was killed um, on that day in Ohio State by a National Guardsman. Um, so it was a really difficult time. There was a lot of controversy in this country. Um, it was problematic for veterans who were returning from this war. Um, people like my husband, Pierre, who had served in Vietnam, um, were coming back and not wearing a uniform when they came back because people would spit on them or, you know, um, call them bad names. Um, people like my husband were going to VA hospitals, and remember we had DSM-2, so it was all neurosis then, um, and if they got it, received a diagnosis, um, it was called a war neurosis. 
um, which is better than in earlier times. It could have been soldier's heart, which was a Civil War diagnosis, shell shock, I think, which was a World War I, battle fatigue, um, combat neurasthenia, if you were in Europe, vent du brule in France. Um, and they were lucky if they got a diagnosis, but for the most part, the doctors that were treating them, who were World War II physicians, were saying, come on, son, just get yourself together and move on with your life. Um, so there was not a lot of sympathy, I think, for the returning veterans at this time. And if you were a woman coming home, forget it. I mean, there were no, there was n there were no um, facilities at all in VA hospitals for women um, and very little acknowledgement of the service that they provide or the hardships that they endured. Well, meanwhile, back in Chapel Hill, um, following our protagonist, um, I had started in the doctoral program with Bert Kaplan. Um, um, and this was an, another, uh, an extension of my psychosocial interests. Um, I was really hooked on epidemiology by this time, for sure. Um, and I extended my interest in alcohol-related problems. Um, but in this case, I looked beyond just mere availability and wanted to look at economics and social norms. So I went to a little Arabic country where they thought they had a horrible problem with alcohol, um, and yet they um, it was very well off e economically. Um, alcohol was actually liberally available there, and yet the social norms, obviously it was a Muslim country, so the social norms prohibited it. Turns out that their consumption rates were lower than they had thought, and they didn't have nearly as many problems as they had expected. So it was an interesting experience um, as well as a, um, a, a learning process. And I fully support student travel, by the way, um, to, to support their interests. So moving on to the 1980s. Um, in sports, Michael Jordan was actually old enough to go to college by then. Coach K had been hired at Duke. Um, and a little known fact was that Coach K actually offered Michael Jordan a scholarship. Um, and I don't know whether you can read that letter very well or not, um, but basically he's saying he's writing to, he was sorry to learn that Michael Jordan was no longer interested in Duke University, but he wished him well and he knew that he would have an impact for whatever team he played for. Well, little did he realize, of course, he had a huge impact. Um, Michael Jordan um, was part of that national championship team in 1982, and North Carolina State won in 1983. Uh, Michael Jordan did not finish school um, didn't, uh, during the four years that he was allotted, um, but he did come back and finish, um, so he does have an undergraduate degree from here, and it was actually fun to see him around campus during those days. It was a very cool experience. In terms of what was going on socially, John died. Um, actually, he was killed. He was murdered um, by a deranged person in New York. Um, it was right outside of his apartment building, so we're down to three Beatles now. Um, liquor by the drink was finally available in Chapel Hill. The drinking age returned to 21. Um, this was largely a function of it was tied to highway safety funds, but there was a lot of epidemiology that contributed to this. Um, um, and epidemiologists, epidemiologists had found that there were a lot of people, young kids dying in the 18 to 21 year old age range from alcohol. And it was hard to learn how to do two new things, drink and drop, at the same time. So it resulted in um, raising the age to 21. And I think it's still there in, in almost all states. We did start to have um, PCs, um, but we didn't have any email. So you still had to rely on telephoning. Um, or faxing was a very new thing back then. You could fax stuff to people. In mental health, um, we finally got DSM-3. Um, and what's interesting about DSM-3 is that the whole basis for diagnosis changed. So rather than kind of involving these Freudian and psychoanalytic um, concepts, um, they were really based on a set of criteria, symptom-based criteria. Um, what it meant was that 
a whole new set of tools could be devised for making a diagnosis, which meant that lay interviewers could actually be used in some cases, in the non-clinical cases, and it meant that you could do psychiatric epidemiology. So you could actually study population prevalence using some of these lay, base, lay interview um, um, techniques and learn what's the prevalence of depression, what's the prevalence of whatever. In addition, post-traumatic stress disorder was codified, so for the first time it's now a diagnosis, um, even though it's five years after the war in Vietnam, and it's largely, I think, attributable to veterans who served in Vietnam. It's the reason that it became a diagnosis. They, oops, sorry, they had gone and complained to their providers, and eventually people had heard, the psychiatrists had heard and understood, and so it became officially recognized as a diagnosis. In 1980, the FDA approved fluoxetine. Some of you may know that as Prozac. Um, and that becomes notable um, in a few more slides. So I mentioned that the, um, it was possible to do um, large epidemiolo epi epidemiology studies. Um, one of the first set of those studies were the ECA, or the Epidemiologic Catchment Area Studies. And their major kind of finding was that 28, about 28 percent of us have a psychiatric disorder of some variety, um, a, a one-year prevalence of psychiatric disorder. Now, what we've come to understand is that some of that are sort of minor little phobias that probably don't count for very much, but even so, that was a lot more than anybody had understood previously. However, less than 20 percent um, of those with a disorder had sought treatment. Um, and more people sought treatment in the general medical sector than in the mental health specialty care. And that was kind of a, 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 an amazing and surprising finding. Even though not many are seeking treatment, it was more in the general medical setting. But what was unclear was, were general medical providers recognizing any of these disorders? And if so, were they doing anything about it? Um, and if they were doing anything about, uh, about it, was it working? Um, so I became involved in a study um, um, where we were looking at depression in primary care. Um, we screened patients for depression and those who were depressed, we then randomly provided information to their primary care provider about their depression status. So we either told their provider, yes, this one is depressed, or, or, or we gave the provider nothing. And then we followed these patients for 12 months and we looked at um, recognition, treatment, and depression status as our outcomes. Um, and what we found was that with this feedback, we could in fact improve recognition.